This is Dialogue. Dialogue, a presentation of the Public Affairs and Special Events Department of KLRB News. This is Dialogue Assassination with Research Specialist Mae Russell for KLRB. I'm Gloria Barron. And today also we have a guest with Mae. This is Preston Guillory. He's a former member of the L.A. Sheriff's Department, and he just came back from testifying at the um, penalty phase of the Manson trial. So I think maybe we could start out with that, May. Um, that's sort of a blockbuster right there. Start with the Manson trial. Okay, before we get on to the Manson trial, you know, we did one full hour of the broadcast, and we've done comments since on the books that are coming out. I think we should make one comment about the drug scene that caused so much controversy here in Monterey last week. I was at the college, and I spoke to the students. And I spoke on the air about the effect of drugs controlling the minds of the students to reduce their interest in political activity or organization. And a lot of students um, took issue to my hitting <laughs> upon drugs that they have been using, and they objected to my inferring that they were available, and they objected to all the suggestions that I made about the drugs. The reason I brought up the subject of drugs was because of two articles in the news last, the week before, one from the New York Times called Youth's Great Ego Trip is Fading Out. And the nature of the article, a long article, was giving the history of the youth of 1960, the 1960s into the 70s, and how they used to be vociferous, they objected to the war, they objected to the shooting at Kent State and Cambodia and Jackson State. But they are accepting now the fact of the assassinations and the riots and the killings. And the New York Times said, in quote, they have survived years of crisis, conflict and turmoil, of war, assassinations, riots, and demonstrations. And now is the time for settling down and pursuing their individual interests and even their pleasures. And they have the use of marijuana that has spread through most segments of the population. It doesn't divide the hip from the straight anymore. And they are quieting down, end quotes. Um, I feel that the problems are greater now than they were at the time of Cambodia and Kent State, and that my opinion is, based upon a lot of research and articles that I have saved, that there is a concerted effort to see that you students do quiet down, and the radical movement either stays politically radical and then gets busted. So it becomes ineffectual, and the radicals get locked up in jail through the use of grass. Or the effect is to give you a false sense of being secure that doesn't really exist. Now, a lot of you can argue that having grass does not affect your capacity to respond in a certain situation. And if that's true, then why take it at all if it's illegal? If it doesn't have some effect upon you, um, None at all. Why take a chance of being arrested? And if it does have an effect upon you, ask yourself exactly what it is. Uh, there's an article in Playboy this month by Mr. Polanski, Sharon Tate's husband, and he felt very badly that he was not with her at the time that these murders occurred. He thinks that he could have responded in a way that was more appropriate to the situation, that all of those people at the time that their house was broken into and they were massacred, were on some form of drug, marijuana or other drug, and they were very passive. And when the girls broke into the house, Sue Atkins and the other girls and Tex Watson, uh, the Folger girl looked up and said, we'll come right in. And she was very hospitable, and she was zonked out. And Polanski had been a victim of Nazi persecution. His parents were killed in concentration camps. He had run for his life, been shot, had lived in the street of the jungle and the battle and the revolution and the war. And he would have recognized those faces as not being fellow hippies or love people at all. And he felt that his response, based upon his past experience, would have been more appropriate to what was really happening. At least there would have been a struggle of some kind. He wouldn't have given up. Now, the young people may object 
to that opinion of what is happening to them. And to quote another article we had last week of Lewis Tackwood, an informer in the L.A. Police Department, for 10 years was involved in undercover work as an agent provocateur. And this also was in the New York Times, and he said this, this is one of his many charges, he was charged, quote, that the police allowed narcotics to be sold in black and Chicano communities to create a dependency on the drug and to undercut political movement, end quote. Well, he limited his own experience to memos and work in the Los Angeles Police Department with blacks and Chicanos. But my research is extensive, and I feel that it goes into the upper-class white radical community, too. And if you don't feel that you are a victim of this kind of a conspiracy to keep you at a very happy level, uh, then you're not really aware it's going on in America. You can defend your position and say you have your full senses and that your choice of marijuana is optional and it doesn't affect your studying or where you're going. And I beg to differ with you on many, many counts. And we won't go into the drug thing now today because we have a guest. But I feel that if there's no difference between taking a drug or not taking a drug, why bother? And if there is a difference, really analyze what is happening to you. Look at yourselves and your generation and see how quiet you are now when last year you cared a lot and then next year you'll care less. The name of the game right now is mind control and then we'll go into the Manson thing. The in 1968, the slogan for elections was law and order. In 1970, they were coming down on anarchy and chaos. The 1972s are going to be mind control. And in 1963, when I began my research into who is Lee Harvey Oswald, and did six years of research on who he saw, who he met, where he traveled, who he was with, and who he associated with, the image of Lee Harvey Oswald was totally different than the one you were told. He was not without jobs. They told you he had no friends, no meaningful relationships, and a long list of adjectives described Lee Harvey Oswald. And I went into the origin of who was saying these things because he was a very brilliant agent who was adept at Russian language and at microdotting and photographic techniques, electronic work, radio work and uh, radar work in the service for several years with top security clearances. And this is a mind control to make you believe that Lee Harvey Oswald was the person, the lone person involved in the killing of John Kennedy. Now we did a show, an entire show on Charles Manson because many people don't realize that Charles Manson is in the same category as Lee Harvey Oswald Sirhan Sirhan and James Ray, that Charles Manson did not kill any one of the persons, seven people that he's accused of murdering or in, in starting the brain control of the people who did the murder. And in that new book that just came out uh, on Manson, Ed Sanders, book called The Family, this is a quotation. If the story were known about the Tate Bianca murders, there would be a big stink of a scandal. I am silent because of the age-old code of, code of criminal behavior that makes telling the names of those involved a crime equal to the crime itself, end quotes. Charlie Manson said it. Now, Oswald, the two days that he was alive after his arrest, said, I did not kill anybody. I am a patsy. Sirhan Sirhan said, if the truth were out, if the world find out, they'd be very surprised by the truth. James Ray told Bradford Huey through letters, I'm a patsy. I was given money and told to be at a certain place in the South when the bullets were fired. Nobody can see him. He said he was a decoy. The biggest patsy of, of our state, of our times, and historically will go down as the largest patsy of this generation, perhaps bigger than Oswald Sir Hanaway, is the image of Charlie Manson that was to come down on a whole class of society, namely the youth and the hippies. Now, our guest, Preston, we ought to get into the discussion of Manson. <clears throat> I met you about three weeks after I had done an hour show here on the Charles Manson story. And do you want to go into the circumstances, how your experiences in Los Angeles, because Preston's here, and he was in on the arrest of Charles Manson, and uh, maybe by rehashing uh, some of his experiences and my going to my research, you can pick up some of what our Manson show is about. Do you want to tell about some of your experiences with arresting Charles Manson the first time? Okay, I'd like to make a point right here that 
you were discussing uh, what I think was the fabrication of uh, political scapegoats in the United States. Manson, James Earl Ray, and uh, Sirhan Sirhan. All these people were simply fabricated almost out of thin air because their backgrounds do not correlate with their situation and their attitude at the time that they were supposed killers. Uh, Manson's background, and I can point out as we go into this, in no way indicated that he had the potential for what he's supposed to have done in the manner in which it was supposed to have been accomplished. Manson is uh, said to have been, the t uh, you know, used other people as tools to accomplish his bidding. And uh, people that are familiar with Manson and his acts at the Spahn Ranch will tell you that Manson was the type of person who always did things which had to be done himself. He didn't believe in delegating authority. He was a person who went forward and accomplished a specific task himself without depending on other people. This I uh, found out uh, and developed in conversations with his attorney, Irving Kinnerick. I went down to Los Angeles uh, the 4th of this month, which was uh, Thursday a week ago, to uh, testify at the penalty phase of Manson's trial for the defense. Mr. Kinnerick is attempting this time to get the sentence of uh, life imprisonment rather than uh, death, so he won't have two death penalties to, over, over, to overturn in the courts. Evel Younger, former district attorney of Los Angeles County, now our attorney general, made it in the office on the Charles Manson conviction, plain and simple. Uh, he used Manson, and he used him very completely and consumed him as a person for his own political gain, for his own ego trip, to get into the state house. And he's not finished with Manson. He's not finished using the California penal system. He's not finished using a lot of systems within the state of California for his own political gain. He's only started. They've only, I think they've only started coming down on the youth, too. The mistrust, the, the, the idea of, of witchcraft, and, and that our good American children's minds are being controlled. This is the thing that they're going to pull out of the bag as time goes on. Right. They try to point out that the, uh, the dependency on drugs leads to uh, you know, a desire to get into the occult and mysticism and other fringe uh, areas, well, you know, fuzzy thinking, as we call it. And uh, there's a direct correlation now between uh, form the, uh, the attitude formerly held by the left on middle America sitting around watching a football game with a, with a can of beer, and now you have the situation where the left is sitting around listening to a popular rock group with earphones on or just completely blasting out their eardrums while they're smoking goat, you know, smoking grass or dropping acid. And that there's the same situation going on there. And they don't seem to realize, unfortunately, that this is the way middle America has been controlled for years by satiating their desires and their aggressiveness and controlling their activity to a point whereas they're given something they like, okay, booze or entertainment or Hot, heavy rock and, and uh, you know grass to smoke. Yeah, and that'll keep them happy. That, exactly. That, it's hard to get them to get interested into just sitting down and taking a book and cross filing it or reading it and saying, look, here is this evidence. What are you going to do with it? It's so much easier to lie to join. Mm -hmm. it, and this is a really good way out. Well, I mean, I've long felt that the the greatest handicap the American public has is their inability to, to correlate information. There's so much information available daily from the newspapers, underground press, radio, and TV. And if you listen and read all of these sources, you can assimilate this if you know what to read and what yeah, you're but, looking for. But, but they, they can't correlate it. The problem is that once you correlate, like I work on it, and I correlate it, and I put it into about 800, 1,800 subject categories. So if you talk about any one particular thing, I can pull out... This file, like I showed you the one last night about Howard Hughes, the thing was in the paper yesterday about does he even exist? Tremendous power of, of the man and the wealth and, and the mystery of this person affecting social and political changes, warfare, state, and we don't even know if there is such a person. And so when I was talking to you, all I had to do is go to my filing cabinet and pull out a file on Howard Hughes. But if you say that to other people, they say, well, if all you say is true, I'm going to lie to joint because it's too heavy for me to handle. You know, well, they, they take the attitude, well, it's gone too far. What can I do? I, I'm just going to try and make my last years on earth happy and contented. The thing is this, you have an adequate amount of time, or apparently have had an adequate amount of time to correlate and to uh, document what you've been saying and discussing. Most people don't have this much time, but if people can get together in small groups, five, ten people, and each of them be assigned to a specific topic or area to gather information on and then pool their knowledge, set up a filing system, cross-index, this can be done because we're being lied to on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in the press, 
I, when I was a member of the Sheriff's Department, we used to get a big kick out of reading crime accounts in the newspapers and reading the same account in the <laughs> arrest report and then reading... Uh, we, I used to read the underground papers, and a lot of the, a lot of the policemen I knew did. And uh, usually we found that the underground press was more factual in reporting crime incidents than the media was. I'm saying the Los Angeles Times and the Herald Examiner would put out false reports of a police incident and the real facts could be found out by reading the underground yeah, press. But even in the major newspapers, if you can't get the underground press, right after the murder of Sharon Tate and Manson was arrested, Sue Atkins said there were two men that went in the house. And I mentioned this on another program. Well, they ran a whole trial and only said that Tex Watson was the only man. And the news media, nobody has correlated the news media's account that there were two men. They don't deny it and they don't investigate it. And that was dropped completely that another murder would be out at large, or like in the Frazier trial up here in Santa Cruz, uh, or with Ray or Sirhan, the second man or more always gets away with Oswald the second Oswald. There's always second or third or fourth. <laughs> and the major newspapers carry the story of these doubles. That's what blows my mind. It's in the San Francisco Chronicle, the LA Times, and still the people can't correlate this information. They will still accept the fact that Manson did it. But... Uh, before I met you, and I had been doing a couple of years' research on the Manson family and said this was a political murder and Manson was a patsy, um, I tried to show the listeners the chronology of this particular case. And then after I met you, you told me how you worked in the Sheriff's Department, and they arrested Manson and let him go and even had foreknowledge of him before the Sharon Tate massacre, that he could have been confined in jail and those murders wouldn't occur. Isn't that what you told me? Exactly. Manson was on federal parole. There is no reason why he should have been on the street at the time the Tate killings uh, went down. Very simply stated, Manson was on parole from 1967 forward. During that period, I know of no job that he held, which would have constituted a job as the parole board looks upon a job. He was living at the Spawn Ranch, not a place where a parolee normally is expected to live. He had access to alcohol, narcotics, and uh, illicit sex. When, I'm, when I say illicit sex, I'm talking about minor girls. And all this was going down in full, with, with full knowledge of his parole officer as well as the officers at Malibu Patrol Station. And machine guns. You machine had the guns, weapons, right. the parolee with the weapons. When I was there, when I was at Malibu, we knew that there were machine guns being fired on the Spawn Ranch. We had citizen complaints about this. We had firemen who were on the fire trails and were stopped by members of Manson's band who were armed with machine guns and told they couldn't go there because, you know, they were using this road or something. And uh, while this was going on, we were forbidden to make arrests. The, the station had a policy prior to the Spawn Ranch raid, which was for Grand Theft Auto. Our policy was make no arrests, take no police action towards Manson or his followers. And needlessly, any thinking officer would have said, this is fuzzy thinking. Why is he being left on the streets? <laughs> because uh, there were numerous crimes being committed by Manson and his group. In case in point, Manson was arrested once prior, to my knowledge, once prior to the, the Spawn Ranch raid, he was arrested for a statutory rape. And uh, there were just so many things going down which were criminal in nature, but no action was taken. All this information we were directed to put on a memo with a cover sheet so it couldn't be read by people who didn't have business reading it and was going directly to intelligence via the station captain. And we don't know what intelligence was doing with all this information, but we know, do know that the officers in uniform were being used to a certain extent to keep Manson under surveillance. I don't know if Manson was under surveillance by intelligence or not. I can only speculate. My best guess is you're damn right he was under surveillance, yeah. if not by our intelligence, by some intelligence. Can I go, f I want to digress for a moment, get into the area of what constitutes the most major police departments. Yeah, go ahead. I feel that within most metropolitan areas, people are policed by three different police departments, all within one police department. Now, let's break that down. The first unit is the unit the public has contact with, the fellows in the black and white cars. They do a fantastic job in most cases. They find lost children, they get dogs out of trees, or cats, whatever's fair. <laughs> they... Uh, they if you try citations, they investigate traffic accidents, they do a pretty good job. Now, we have the second group. This is the tactical unit. They call themselves the tax squad or the crime prevention unit or the special enforcement bureau. Depends on what part of the state you're living in, what they call them. They all do basically the same thing. They're a unit, usually 50 to 100 men, hand-picked, and usually for their size, their aggressiveness, and their, their controllability. 
and their, their lack of sensitivity, lack of empathy. These men are used as an enforcement arm of the third agency within that police department I'm going to talk about. The third agency is the one that we want to get to. That is the intelligence unit. The intelligence unit working closely with the department head, be the sheriff or the chief of police, formulate departmental policy. They're like the CIA. They formulate policy and uh, develop political attitudes and postures towards their dealing with militant groups that are on the right and on the left. Of course, they don't care about the right. They don't care what the right does. Their only concern is what the left is doing. And uh, they use the tactical unit as their enforcement arm, the way we would use the army. Yeah. And if we ever see in this country, as Lewis Tackwood has alleged, about the bomb which will be detonated at the uh, 72, convention. 72 convention in San Diego and then the ensuing uh, uh, riot which will be in, uh, instigated by provocateurs in the crowd, if this goes down, you mark my words, the people who will be going out and doing the majority of the arrests on the uh, national emergency, which is going to be declared after this if this goes down, will be these various tac tac squads and tac tactical units. They'll be supported by the rank-and-file policemen. But as such... These elite little units will be responsible for kicking doors in and taking people out in the middle of the night, uh, circa 1944, Nazi Germany. Uh, this is where we're coming to. I've worked with people who went on to these tactical units in L.A. in L.A. County. I know what they're like. I know what their political philosophy is. I know what their mentality is. And intellectually, uh, they, they, they frighten me. They really do. You see, Greece was overthrown in 1967 by a group of underlings. It wasn't the... The colonel, not the generals of the elite guard or the aristocracy, it was the underlings that came in and, and worked their way up positions behind positions who controlled the tanks and the radios. Those were the two big things that they could, they could cut off the roads and the communication. And they, all the radio, telephone lines and everything were cut, but they could control. The, they kept the communication open between themselves, and everyone else was cut off. Mm -hmm. And then the tanks march off the streets. The, the actual strategy of studying Greece is very interesting. I wish more people would do that instead of worrying about Gettysburg and the Civil War battles or play chess in the evening. If you just study the tactics of how you can close off Greece and then you go into the, the financing of Greece and you see the people that are in power, then you realize where we're at. And these behind-the-scene cops are of one ilk politically. You know, apropos of that, I brought in an article that was in the news this week, it was in the Jack Anderson column, uh, about the man who has the key to the White House. And this is the quote. He is Tom Pappas, a Greek-American who runs Essos Works in Greece. Back in 68, he helped wangle the vice presidential nomination for Greek-American Spyro Agnew and raised millions for the GOP from wealthy Greeks if Richard Nixon would take Agnew as his running mate. Now, the governor of Maryland isn't just in there for a reason. But if Richard Nixon is killed, or, and there's a good chance he could be, or in a state of national emergency, these behind-the-scene people like in Greece, and Mr. Pappas would know about those, this is the kind of scene, those tax squads come in and take over the whole thing. Hmm. They create a riot, and they say, well, we'll investigate the riot. And they say, our intelligence tells us this, there's this many enemies in this place, and they take over. Tell about your arrest of Charlie Manson and how they let him go the first time, hmm. when they could have held him. The rest of Charles Manson at the Spawn Ranch was the biggest circus I've ever been involved in in my life. We attacked the Spawn Ranch on uh, a day, Saturday morning at dawn, one week after the Tate killings. Our department supposedly had no knowledge at the time of the Tate killings and Manson's involvement in the killings. We had 102 deputies. Now, the entire strike force consisted of all of the uh, SEB, Special Enforcement Bureau deputies from L.A. County, plus most of the men from Malibu, and two helicopters and about 35 to 40 radio cars, and I thought we were taking Iwo Jima, to be quite frank. I was waiting to, you know, waiting to put up a flag. But we got in there, and we started kicking doors down. We had a search warrant for Grand Theft Auto, and uh, Manson was arrested and very brutally beaten by the Enforcement Bureau deputies. Really? Yes. That wasn't he funny. was found hidden under some steps in one of the fake uh, storefronts uh -huh. at the Spawn Ranch. Yeah, this didn't go in the arrest report, of course. They heard him. Uh, they heard him. Yeah. Very definitely. They wanted to hurt him because Manson was a sex. It was a sexual thing with the deputies at Malibu. Yeah. Manson was a local stud, and he was uh, <laughs> yeah. not. He was held in contempt by the deputies because Manson had an ever-ending supply of pretty young girls at the Spawn Ranch. And a lot of deputies were, quite frankly, on it. You know, envious. This scrawny young, you know, ex-con scoring constantly. And they were, you know, going home by themselves. 
But anyway, digressing. The thing was that Manson was not very well liked because of what he stood for. You know, he was everything that the uh, the, uh, the rank and file officer was against. I mean, he didn't he didn't uh, stand for motherhood or the sanctity of the church, and you know, Sunday football and contact sports, and uh, you know, he wasn't a he man. But still, the orders they don't arrest him. That must have killed the deputies. They couldn't arrest him. You know, they couldn't. Not arrest. until we had this beautiful yeah. arrest uh, warrant, the search warrant. Then we could arrest him. Yeah, but but to the sub subsequently the, to the arrest, the charges were dropped 72 right. hours later. Which uh, were the guys on the force mad? Were they suspicious? Were they weren't was suspicious. Dropped? I don't think they were aware enough to be suspicious. It's just that they started thinking about this and they said, "Wow, what a big farce! I mean, so much manpower is like." It was yeah. like we were doing something perhaps a week late to show that we had really been watching Manson. And uh, now here's an interesting uh, hypothesis I'm going to discuss. Now, if we were watching Manson prior to the Spawn Ranch raid and Manson committed these killings, we would have seen Manson. Okay. And if we weren't watching him prior to the raid, uh, how did we justify getting the uh, search warrant and making the raid? And the helicopters. And Helico and yeah, everything seems to cancel everything else out in this uh, discussion of what Manson was about and uh, what our intelligence was about. I don't think Irving Kinnerick, Manson's attorney, has, has been able to get, gain access to the Intelligence Bureau's reports on Manson. And uh, I, I personally feel that the surveillance of Manson was not just a local thing. Don't you think the defense of Manson would be to demand the papers of, about him that they had before the murder? Or will they burn those? You know, this morning we were reading the morning paper. It showed a picture of the grand jury testimony. Did you see that at Kent State? And uh, I cross filed the evidence in the John Kennedy murder. Evidence destroyed, evidence altered, evidence missing. Well, now in the Kent State, there's a hearing that will go on, and people have been indicted for inciting this riot. But the grand jury testimony was burned, and they are so open about it. Like now at the Germany, there's a picture on the front page of the San Jose Mercury of a wastebasket and a fire, and page by page, the grand jury report is being burned. It just it is an open state of fascism that people can't even believe. They're just flaunting it at you. Okay, you want this? We're burning it. Where Dr. Humes at the time of Oswald's autopsy, and they say, well, where the original autopsies, he said it was destroyed by burning. Now they're photographed burning the evidence. And how do you handle this? First, what, do you, what do you do with this kind of handling? If Canary can't get the memos of Manson, <laughs> before the crime was committed, and if he's a political patsy, why can't he put the responsibility on the people who had foreknowledge of Manson? Why can't the trial be called off if they can't produce that? Well, there's two uh, two areas we get into here, uh, May, that Canaric's primary concern might be to save Manson's life, to acquit Manson, and to do this, he may have to conduct his defense in such a manner that he does not go into a conspiracy thing or an assassination trip because this could damage the case and result in him not getting uh, the charges reduced or, or dropped in later uh, court challenges. Yeah, but you see, when there's an intense desire by Evel Younger and Richard Nixon and John Mitchell to go in the news media and tell you Manson's guilty, they're not going to ever drop anything on Manson. Because if he was a patsy, they're certainly going to keep that death penalty going. And, and when you choose... Uh, Reinquist is the justice of the Supreme Court, who's the attorney for Nixon and Mitchell, and they're going to make the decision on the lives of 600 men in death row. What do you think he's going to say about Charles Manson and James Ray and Sirhan and Sirhan? Well, Ray gets 99 years in jail, but Sirhan, what's he going to say about the death penalty? Don't they want their patsies dead? True. I'm personally waiting to see if James Earl Ray, Sirhan Sirhan, and Manson develop cancer in jail as Jack Ruby did. Uh, apparently, there's something in, in the jail atmosphere that's, in con oh. that's conducive to people developing fatal diseases. Well, let me read you. You know, if you wanted to get to these... Lead poisoning, perhaps. <laughs> you know, there, a bullet. there was a book that came out. It's called Search for Justice that we've talked about, the program, by John <coughs> Siegenthaler. And I made some notes on that book before we came in today on how James Ray is guarded. Now, James Ray had said to Bradford Ewey and to Mr. Haynes that there was a conspiracy and that he was a patsy. And the book goes into the fact that he left the Missouri State Prison and nobody bothered to look for him. There was no call set out for him. And Judge Battle has kept tight control. He's passed away now. The other judge has kept tight control on the unanswered question. But this is the way you get to James Ray in case you want to know what you do with these people. If, if they don't have cancer, this is the way you get to him. And I'm reading the book now, page 166. Um, there are steel plates that cover the cell windows before he was brought there from England. Closed-circuit television cameras are installed in the cell so every movement is monitored. Brilliant fl 
fluorescent lights around the cells that are never turned off night or day. Feel where Ray is located, you're cleared through a general control center downstairs, and the visitors communicate by microphone with deputies to the control center room. This nerve center of the protective system is equipped with three red and three green lights, and those on the door tell you at what point the door can be unlocked. The red alert means don't open the door. And once through the control center, the family or the lawyer passes through a door in a small anteroom where a sign reads, no guns allowed, and there you're searched by deputies. And from there, you're taken to an elevator to the cell area into a brightly lighted area. And outside the cell, five feet from the entrance of the cell, are two unarmed guards stationed behind a desk. And at one end of the desk is a TV that's provided for Ray and the people visiting him for his entertainment. At the other end of the desk is a monitor on Ray's image in constant view. A second monitor of Ray is kept on the second floor of the jail, and a third monitor is in a wooden cabinet on the desk, desk of Sheriff Morris. And when the cell door opens to Ray, the red light goes on on the sheriff's desk downstairs. Ray's food is placed in a steel lock box, and the key to the box is kept in a bulletproof control center. And the guard on duty carries the food box to Ray's cell, and another guard is fetched for the cell key from the control center. And the guards are required to have security clearances and special tokens are given to the guards and they're exchanged with each shift to pass the token to another guard. And without the tokens, the guards cannot leave or enter a room. One guard has to give it to another guard and his food is in this locked box and it's passed to another bulletproof control room and handed to him through a process of four different people. Now this is the way James Ray is handled. Um, you, if he doesn't have cancer, uh, goodness knows what he's getting maybe out of that steel box and radiation, or goodness knows what, but that's the way you handle the political prisoners like Sirhan and James Ray and Charles Manson. Once they're captured, no one can speak to them. Uh, a man William Bradford Ewey wanted to write a book about James Ray. He never could see him. Everything Ray wrote had to go through the guards, through the controls, was documented, passed to Ewey back and forth. And when he passed one note saying that there was a conspiracy, that was the end of Bradford Ewey's uh, writing about conspiracy. Then the next issue, he said it was a lone assassin, and the whole story was changed. The whole intent of his book was changed. I've always wondered about that. This, he was going to make several disclosures. I was reading the... Uh condensed form of that in the, uh, in the uh, pu publications that were uh, putting excerpts out for the promoting the book, and that's where it stopped off. You know, it would seem as though the authorities in Ray's case have been watching avidly the uh, Mission Impossible show from the steps they've taken. And I don't see any way anybody could get in there, even using the IM forces tactics. Oh, no way. No uh, way. I would think the only way that, if, uh, from what you described, if they ever have a power failure and a fire at the same time, Ray will probably die because it seems virtually impossible if an emergent type of situation such as an earthquake or a natural disaster would strike, they could ever get Ray out in time. Never. Or the guards that are guarding him. You know, I want to describe, if I could, to your listeners, uh, paranoia is something that we hear a lot about, but... Something it's something It's something we have a lot of true, <laughs> Gloria. But it's something that people, uh, you know, I take with a grain of salt. If you've uh, been a member, if you've been fortunate enough, that's probably a, <laughs> that's the correct way of saying it, if you've been fortunate enough to be a member of a police agency and then are on the outside looking in, you can feel extreme paranoia and know that it's real. When I went down to testify at Manson's trial last week, when I was in court, I uh, uh, experienced some very strange feelings. I was uh, noticing, first of all, there were only two deputies, uh, bailiffs, in the court after I was searched outside prior to coming in. I was a surprise witness. No one knew who I was. But as soon as the deputies found out I was a former member of their own department, the phones were all uh, lit in the uh, courtroom. Every deputy, they could get his hands on the phone. They were calling intelligence. They were calling records. They were digging my QM file out, everything they could possibly do. And within the space of five minutes, this courtroom, which only had two bailiffs, unarmed, was suddenly filled with an excess of eight to ten officers, all of the tax squad, SEB, all armed, all with mace, all with their batons, and they sat there, made a game out of, while I was testifying, sitting there, fingering their mace, their guns, and their batons while looking at me. And uh, 
the entire back row of the, of the courtroom now contained law enforcement officers, either plainclothes intelligence people or members of the tactical unit who sat there listening to my testimony. I uh, feel at the time they were trying to find someone who knew me personally who could come in and identify me as being a former member of the department and perhaps add something to the prosecution's case. But uh, it was a very interesting feeling. How would they do? Break you down? by? Uh, oh, how they, they, they might have. They might have indicated as... your credibility uh, or something? My credibility, yes. Yeah. I might point out, those of you, those of your listeners who follow the, char the, uh, the case of Michael Hannon, who was a former L.A. police officer who uh, is now an ACLU attorney in Los Angeles, find, will find that most police departments, when an officer leaves and he becomes a rogue ex-cop, they do their best to discredit him wherever possible and they made him out to be everything but a communist. When I left my own department, they uh, uh, circulated memos to the station, first of all, to Malibu and East Los Angeles, where I'd worked, that no one was to discuss my having been there. And furthermore, they, uh, they uh, intimated that I, would, I must have been on heavy drugs because there's no other way they could account for my suddenly uh, winding up on the left side of the spectrum and having all these revelations about police work and uh, suppression and repression in the United States and in, in law enforcement. Uh, because they felt that when I came on, their screening process was so great that they would have weeded me out had Why I been of that you, political persuasion. Why did you leave the sheriff's department? What was the thing that made you leave? I left because I contacted a uh, radio station in Los Angeles, KLAC, which at the time was a news station, and I told them about the cover-up of the Spawn Ranch raid. And what our, bothered you about it? Well, the fact that I, I noticed too much information being suppressed uh, for political gain and for... Uh, prestige. Uh -huh. And you didn't even know they were involved with the Sharon Tate thing at the time? Uh, I knew this. I, I made this disclosure the day that the Sharon Tate, uh, well, the Manson arrest was announced by the L.A. Police Department oh. in Inyo County. But you felt that, that the whole law enforcement group was putting something down on the actual murders of the people involved? Yes, I had a feeling that, that the whole thing was being used politically by the sheriff and by the district attorney. Uh -huh. And there's, there's a lot of interplay between the sheriff's department and the L.A. City Police because they're both large agencies in Los Angeles, and they're always jockeying for political uh, advantage in the, in the county. Yeah. But uh, I, I just uh, came to a point where I saw too much going down, and uh, Manson was, uh, the Manson case was just something which was too great to go uh, unheralded to the public. I just felt that people had to be made aware, if possible. So I, 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 I was very naive when I contacted the press, and I felt that, wow, they'd really jump on this, and they'd, they'd light up torches, and we would stop cursing the darkness and light a match. Well, this is what I thought with my Somebody research. Somebody stuffed out the match. When I really, yeah, someone stuffed, stuffed out the match. When I found out really what happened in the John Kennedy thing, I thought, well, you know, now people really, now that they see this, here's this document, here's this evidence, here's what they said, and it doesn't match the evidence. And, and look, our government was overthrown, and people would say, oh, I don't like Vietnam, I don't like Lyndon Johnson, I don't like the violence coming down, we'll follow you and, and ride on. No, they, they came to be like, what's your real motive? What are you doing this for? Tell us the truth. You know, you, you can't be altruistic. What's your motive? And I said, no, if, if this is true and if the murders are out on the streets, then we'll have other murders, you know, and deaths. And then Martin Luther King was killed, and Malcolm X, and... And they said, well, you know, if a guy's going to be political and stick his neck out, he's going to get killed, you know, and it has, there's no link. And then when Robert Kennedy was killed, I thought, surely people would come to me then and say, oh, now it's time for you to tell us what you knew about the murder of John Kennedy because the Robert Kennedy thing is so wide open, you know, and, and so easy to see that even the primary, what he's about to grasp, the chance of being a president and so forth. But the reaction was different. People turned away, use the expression instant turnoff. People who were angry at my suggesting a conspiracy in the John Kennedy were simply adamant and don't tell me a thing about Bobby. They were worse. There's not even a book written except the two written by people involved in covering up the murder. Nobody even had a investigation that was public or cared on who was in the investor, who was seeing him, or who the security guards were. Mm. They said, don't tell us anymore. I don't want to know. That's over. And he was buried. Well, May, uh, the attitude is like when uh, Matt, when uh, Nader came forward and said that the General Motors Chevrolets were defective and the motor mounts and so on. The attitude of the public at that point was, well, simply, uh, well, I don't own a Chevrolet, so I'm not going to get excited excited about it. Mm -hmm. The whole idea is that people are, there are three, there, I think there are three main groups of thought in this area about getting involved. There's the group, a very small minority who knows what's going on, who's got it together, and who, in some cases, have gone underground preparing for what is going to go down. There's another group which says, wow, I understand the whole thing, but it's too damn big for me to do anything about, so I'm going to sit here and I'm going to get 
I'm going to really mess my mind up. I'm going to smoke and I'm going to drop it. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, get a heavy music scene and, you know, drop out. And there's a third group which is unaware of what's going on. The vast, uninformed, uh, well, this thing, don't show it to Majority. Me. Yeah, their yes. eyes won't fall on those things. You know, uh, there was somebody in my home last week who is prominent in the San Francisco area who writes articles that influence the minds of young people. And uh, I won't mention his name, but if I did, you'd all know who he is. And he's very prominent in the northern area and into the young people and writes articles for the Chronicle all the time on political things in the United States that affect youth and sat in my living room was very resistant to meet me and a mutual friend said i want you to meet her because maybe it'd help you with the political things you're writing you're just at the break of the water but you won't get in you know you won't dip and there was such resistance to meeting me that um, he wanted to show that he really could handle everything i guess so he finally came up and we sat in the living room and the resistance was so great and i began to just breathe a little bit about how conspiracies affect what he's doing and he said, I don't believe a word of what you're saying, you know. And here I've done, you know, almost eight years research, fully documented. And we didn't even go in an area that I call the archives where my work is because it would be offensive to him. It would be taking somebody who has a real hang-up about body and sex who's been repressed all their life and bringing a bunch of nude people for dinner and saying, you know, let's have dinner. He would have been so offended by the raw skin of the research, you know, the thing would just blow his mind and as long as he can talk in generalities which is what all the men like Jack Anderson or Walter Reston or Max Lerner Harrison Salisbury Tom Wicker the intellectual elite if you don't show them the body they'll write about love and sex or government you know don't show me that new thing you know I may just see what it is I may even believe it or go for it you know as long as I don't see it and it's covered up I'm safe Unfortunately, what is happening in the United States is the large media reporters, your, your terrible, well-known reporters, they go into a story too often with their eyes closed. They know what the story is about. They know what they want to hear. They want to hear sensational things. And if you tell them straight from the shoulder and it's the truth and it's not according to you know, what they've been led to believe they want to hear, what they think their readers want to hear is, uh, you know, like they want to do a sensational story, we'll say, on group marriages or group sex <laughs> or sexual promiscuity in, uh, we'll say, Sweden. And if they go to a researcher who tells them there is no great amount of sexual, there's no greater amount of sexual promiscuity in Sweden than there is in the United States, they're going to go to another researcher before yeah. they do their story. Uh, <laughs> they they stay at this very safe level and they say, don't put it in front of my eyes. Mm -hmm. And they make money off the system. They're the system of <coughs> liberals. They're really the eunuchs walking around. They're, they're, they're exactly. the whole uh, system liberal. They they make their check every month, every day, writing their columns and teasing you like the fact that Richard Nixon had a Nazi worshiping in the White House. Maybe Jack Anderson got $500 to tell you that. Mm -hmm. But if you say, do you want to know what other Nazis he was with who were also in Dallas? He doesn't answer your letter. He'll only do about a Nazi. That's safe. Don't, don't link it to the other ones, you know. I don't want to know it. If I can paraphrase Mark Twain, uh, Mark Twain was noted for saying that there's a lot more truth in the world than there'll, be, you know, than there'll ever be a demand for. <laughs> uh, people yeah. don't want the truth. What they want is things which make them feel warm and toasty inside and make them feel secure. Now, we get into the security thing. Let's, uh, let's ask ourselves. i got some notes here. I was thinking about the, the Tate killings. We'll suppose for one moment now that we had uh, a group having a party and they were wearing, you know, straight you know, clothes. Straight clothes. Flame Maybe bridge. a Brooks Brothers Brooks pursuit, an <laughs> evening gown, and they're having daiquiris, and they're all married to somebody in the room, and they're not trying to, you know, put the make on somebody else's wife. They're all doing the straight middle America scene. They're having a nice pot cocktail party, and Manson and his group, okay, burst, would burst in and then wipe all these people out. Sure, it would be in the press, but it wouldn't be in the press quite as much as an incident that we do have here, a real life incident where one non-group was attacked by another non-group. Non-group meaning that they were not. They're recognized by societies having no redeeming social value, so as such, I call them non-groups from the society point of view. Now, if that had happened, the thing would have died out very rapidly. The case would have been, you know, fine, gone to court, trial, everything. But uh, the fact that here were these people leading a hedonistic lifestyle, <laughs> there was promiscuous sex amongst people who weren't married to one another, 
there were males and females right, thin in the same room that weren't fully clothed. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. female parts of the anatomy exposed. And there was narcotics there, and oh, it was just terrible. Also, there was a lot of money, and the fact that most of the people involved in the, they were in the Tate home, were, uh, you know, they were pseudo-intellectuals, they were, they thought they were in the left movement. They were in they the were, political things. They were, they were, oh yeah. They were with Robert Kennedy the night he was killed. They had dinner with him the night he went to the ambassador. Very political. And the Folger girl worked at Watts. He worked against uh, Yorty's campaign for a black, Bradley, mm -hmm. you know, they were into the black thing, the underdog scene working in that, and maybe trafficking drugs, and they didn't have any clothes on, mm -hmm. and it really made a, a exciting story, you know? Let's also get into the homosexual scene we were discussing earlier. <laughs> in every major political assassination in the United States, uh, May and I were discussing the fact that a homosexual has been uh, present. Many no, wait, wait, we'll get people putting okay. this down. Well, we're well, not anti-homosexual. No, no, I'm not trying to... Uh, <laughs> yeah. to uh, Put it down discredit by. homosexuals. What I'm trying to point out is that this homosexuals, by nature of the fact that they must lead a clandestine life, existence, have are subjects, used. have Absolutely. been used, and are still being used for political gain. Remember, Glory, we talked about, I was going to do a show on right. sex life and political assassinations right. on the use of about 30 or 40 single men. Well, uh, this is why Preston came up with men, single men involved in that massacre, similar to the other ones. Right. Here's some facts about the Manson case that many people didn't, uh, you have to read between the lines of the uh, press reports. First of all, Steve Parent, the young man who was visiting uh, uh, Manson, uh, was visiting, excuse me, the caretaker at the, at the Tate uh, residence, was a uh, junior grade burglar and a narcotics dealer. Now, we don't want to get into libel, the libelous area. I hope I'm not getting into the libelous area. The fact is quite plain that the young man was homosexual for all intents and purposes, and uh, he and Steve Parent were con conducting a liaison. And, uh, of course, this fellow, the caretaker, was, was brought in for three days and was released. And the circumstances of how he didn't hear any sounds and what he was doing on the ground and the warmer dogs and all that has never really been investigated. They just hushed that whole thing up. I don't even think he came into the trial thing at all. It was just set to the Vance and did it. Last I heard, he had a suit against the city for a false arrest, and he's living uh, with his parents back east someplace. He immediately left the area. Yeah. But... Uh, it would appear as though there was a very, there was a very sensitive. We get into a very sensitive area when we start start talking about the caretaker's involvement. Whose name I can't even recall his name. His involvement plus his re relationship or alleged relationship with the with, with, uh, with Steve Parent. Uh -huh. Now I can't. I'm not going to come forward and say that I have facts that Steve uh, Parent was a homosexual and he was a burglar and he dealt in narcotics. But, but by there are certain uh, facts. There are certain conclusions we yeah. can draw from the information available to us. But coming down on this group was the way that they could control the minds of the people and really get them scared like look what's happening that these people are doing these things and and um, nobody really cared about the victims but it made good copy to read about it right in fact i think everybody should uh buy the playboy december playboy of this month the interview of polanski sharon tate's husband it's the first interview that he's had in two years and uh, i might read just the way it starts off Playboy said to him, for the past two years, you've remained silent about the murder, and your wife and friends, despite the enormous and lurid exposure, are you willing to tell your side of it now? And Polanski said, it's not something I talk about with friends, but I want to go through it once from the beginning to the end, and I have trouble, di difficulty in reconstructing that period. He said, the way the news media came down on him it was unbelievable. That's the he said. Time magazine. He refers to referred to the way he lived, and they and they referred to the films he made. And he said it, in quotes from Time, it was a scene as grisly as anything in Polanski's films. Exploration of dark and melancholy side of the human character. End quote. And Polanski said, I was baffled at the cheapness, the platitude, of writing, the sensationalism, and. None of the truth. He said that they used his movies as an example of what happens to people and tried to make the victims guilty of their own murder. The reporting, he said, about Sharon and the murders was virtually criminal. Reading the papers, I could not believe my eyes. I could not believe my eyes. They blamed the victims for their own murders. I really despise the press. I didn't always. And then he goes on to the thing about the orgies and sex and sadism and celebrities and masochism and suicide and witchcraft and rituals and the truth will come out i feel someday very shortly or i hope it will in our lifetime president and glory that the truth is going to come out that these people were selected 
by a certain group that engineered this particular massacre. And the, the truth, the banking, where the money came from in Texas, the credit cards in Texas, they're investigating in Kansas City. There were rumors of uh, the banking and so forth coming from Kansas City. Oh, Preston was making a point. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. What, what point? I the, lost uh, my train. You had brought up the homosexual um, involvement in the... Uh, oh, yeah. Mm. Well, I wish is that they wanted to come down on this whole group that was doing their own individual thing, that, that uh, homosexuality is not a thing that should be looked down upon, but people's minds are so twisted that to make it look like a really gory scene, they could come down on all these people. They knew their individual habits. And then the, uh, the uh, La Bianca killings were simply a matter of Mr. and Mrs. Mill America, Mr. and Mrs. Nice were what? attacked. Also to point out that not only will uh, this degenerate segment of society attack people who are almost in their own group. You see, you can't say the Tates were in the same group as Manson because uh, and Manson and the and the clan and the family, because the Tates were you know they were they were pseudo everything the whole the whole group there, they all had access to tremendous amounts of money and, and they all made token efforts to be to become liberals to to salve their own conscience, uh, whereas the uh, La Biancas were you know solid American type people they were in business they had uh, money they you know would never I'm sure got involved in anything like what the uh, the people at the Tate House were involved in. Yeah, well, the habits, the individual habits of these people were used to hide the motives of the murder. Exactly. You know, we were reading the article yesterday of a man in the State Department who got his security clearance because he's homosexual, and they said the time of blackmailing people, putting fears because of their individual sexual habits should be over, you know, and they should accept them as individuals. But coming down on this particular house with the drugs <coughs> and the sex and the nudity and everything it made a shocking story and it called attention to a man named Manson who was a creation of the news media now in in the um, Playboy article Polanski knows full well that Manson was not a hippie and he this is an interesting thing he refers to Manson as being just nothing but an ex-convict and getting out of the jail and this is what he said one of the things he said is people have to dismiss the fact that Manson had a criminal track record. They don't want to think of that, that he spent a great deal of time in prison. He had a long record before he tried to be a hippie. And his philosophy was basically criminal, and no one mistook him for Jesus. Then Belansky went on to say, hippies don't exist anymore, and the hippie movement has degenerated. But the degeneration came from the top, not the bottom. When the kids began preaching new values, the government tried to beat their ideas out of them. Now, Volansky is saying that the government is trying to change our value system. And I think if we work long and hard enough on who Tex Watson was, who trained these people with military ambushes, who that ex-Marine was who's mentioned in Ed Sanders' book, who, who helped uh, uh, Manson, you know, with his Vietnam experience, helped him back at the Spawn Ranch, what kind of help was that? Our ex-Marines coming home and training Manson, you see? He was groomed with a hippie jargon, but that wasn't the real Charlie Manson. And that kind of mind control of the young people is, and the parents, all the parents of the people going around today, come down on their children. And, and if the kids get stabbed or thrown out of a car, they say, huh, that's what you deserved. You were hitchhiking. May it, it appears that what the government is trying to do is to convince people the value system, what they're trying to set up the value system is that they want to convince people that uh, Nirvana is people living in the suburbs in a split level with a lot of electric appliances with plastic cases which are warm to touch and a two terror face kids and a pretty wife and a large dog that you know yeah barks wow. barks when you come home this myth. this is the myth and this this whole myth means you go out and you buy this house you buy the products that go inside to make this house work you buy you buy you buy you consume you, you, you must consume products. And if you don't consume, uh, then Rand does a study about how to take care of you. Right. They'll, they'll decide how you're going to consume. Yeah. You must consume to keep this glorious society of ours going. You know, if you don't buy a new toaster every three years and a new car every three and a half, society as we know it will come to a standstill. You go to yeah. France, you go anywhere in Europe, you see a, you know, the average car is 10 to 15 years old. It was my experience when I was in France. And people there, they make use of things they buy. They don't buy things to consume them. We buy things here everything is a consumable uh, we must consume everything we use and that includes people yeah. we are very busy consuming people that help make our society 
go. That is, for instance, if you were to eliminate poverty and uh, illiteracy in the United States, you just knocked two uh, very important political issues right in the you know iconic tag. You can't eliminate things in the United States that politicians need to get elected on. What would man use for his platform if there was no poverty, if there was no racism, if there was no materialism, if there was no war? All and, of these things help get people reelected each year. And what will Evel Young or and Mitchell and Agnew do if there are no youth to come down either? Now, or read it. Read the speeches. If the prisons are bad and the prisoners object, they say the radicals did it. What would they do without this new class of hippie to come down on? And you'll see more of it in the news media. They, like, they need poverty. They need this young, young group. They need the drug thing to they arrest need. them if they become too aware now of of the kind of things we're talking about. They'll come in and bust them, you know, and and ruin their lives, you know, and get their jobs fired and everything. They needed this group of young people to come down on as they became more intelligent and aware. And they did it through the creation of Charlie Manson. And it was highly financed and very carefully skilled and programmed in costume. It's the only way the Youngers and the Mitchells in the United States can justify their existence. First, if you don't have any poverty, you will have a minimal yeah. amount of crime. And with a minimal amount of crime, uh, people such as Younger can't justify their existence. Police departments will not be able to justify large expenditures for electronic surveillance gear, and the big thing right now is every police department wants its own computer. Yeah. Berkeley, just, Berkeley just got theirs over the objections, I think, of the city council. Uh, my friends, they're not, they're putting a lot more into these computers than just information on who's wanted for traffic warrants. Yeah. Well, listen, I think we're going to have to wind this up, Gloria. Yeah. Huh? In about a minute. Yeah. Well, I, I think that one of the things you have to think about um, is the fact, again, that Polanski says that Manson is more like the story of in cold blood or Hitler's army, that the books coming out that try to tell you that young minds were molded by Manson are not true. The murders that were done were identical to the Charles Whitman or Richard Speck or Lieutenant Cowley. They're done by straight people, not people with grass, not people with LSD. They're done by straight people, criminal acts. And then they put the guitar in their hand or a fringe coat to tell you that marijuana and LSD were responsible for these murders. There isn't a bit of evidence to document this. And uh, I think that, that we should very shortly get more truth out on this subject. Right. Uh, but do you have any, any hope? Like you say they want something nice and warm to ha hang on to, to, uh, to comfort them. Uh, do you think the, uh, the bomb will go off at the uh, convention? Uh, do you think there's any way that it can be prevented? It's a hypothetical situation, but I think that if a bomb doesn't go off there, something else will take place. And uh, my big question for the people in your listening audience is, if this thing does go down and there is a national set of a national emergency declared and the Guard scoops up all the left-wing people, will the people who are not yet radicalized, who remain, will they, in essence, immediately go underground and twice the numbers of the people arrested and carry on the work of the people who were arrested. I don't think arrested. they will. In Greece, a general I apathy took over. I hope they do. I don't know. Well, that is a hope. That's He's hopeful. The only I'm hope not. we have. Yeah. I'm hopeful. <laughs> you might also, also ask people, that, you know, when you go through school, I remember every morning, the first thing we did, we did the Pledge of Allegiance bit, and the last line of the Pledge of Allegiance, and liberty and justice for all. Mm -hmm. Let that ring in your ears and then pick up your morning newspaper and read it and find out what a farce that last line is. Yeah. Thank you, Preston Guillory. Thank you, May. <laughs> Listening to Dialogue. <laughs> Dialogue is a presentation of the Public Affairs and Special Events Department of KLRB News.